The last time we looked at the system, I concluded that its SWP co-powered DOS expansion wasn't good for, well, much of anything really. As it turns out, I may have been wrong, and I may owe an apology to this KPRO4 Plus 88. Previously, I demonstrated this KPRO CPM machine running MS-DOS using an 8088 expansion. After failing to execute every single program I tried, I concluded that this SWP co-power running DOS 1.25 just wasn't compatible enough to run anything. Software would either crash back to a prompt, run out of memory, or lock up the machine entirely. This conclusion was further supported by additional testing that I performed after the episode aired. Jim Leonard helped out by coding up this test routine that doesn't rely on any hardware-specific function calls and should definitely work under DOS 1.25. Upon assembling and executing the resulting binary, the KPRO still locked up. If it can't run this, there's little chance of it running anything at all. Oh well, thanks to Jim for his help in proving what I suspected. Case closed, right? Well, not so fast. Since I can't leave well enough alone, I kept fiddling with the system, and that's when I discovered that commands on the DOS boot disk itself that had previously worked fine, such as check disk, were now locking up the machine. The plot thickens. Alright, I want to test something out here. In the previous episode, I copied WordStar into the CoPower's CPM RAM disk, and it ran perfectly. Let's try that same operation again today. This time, it's failing to verify the copied data. I'm starting to see a pattern here. Things that had previously worked are now broken. Armed with this new information, I have a hypothesis. Something on the co-power board failed in the middle of filming the last episode, which caused me to arrive at the erroneous conclusion that the system is incompatible with even the simplest text-based DOS software. Here's my new theory. Initially, everything was fine, and the RAM disk and DOS programs worked. Later on, something failed, perhaps a RAM chip. DOS was still able to boot, but attempting to load third-party programs into memory caused data to be written to the newly faulty chip, resulting in the crashes I observed. In order to troubleshoot, I'm going to need to get access to the co-power board, which is pretty easy to remove. So here's the SWP co-power 88. Pretty compact, right? This silk-screened KPRO 88 isn't used in any of the marketing literature that I've seen. The entire system is powered by 5 volts from the KPRO supply. This ribbon cable connects to a daughter board on the Z80 side and carries all the I.O. for the system. Here's the CPU, an Intel P8088 running at 5 MHz. No manufacturer date is listed, but it does have a 1981 copyright. Finally, here's the system's RAM, where I suspect the problem lies. We'll take a closer look at that in a moment. Since we're talking about the RAM, one thing I remembered from reading the product literature while making the first KPRO episode was that the CoPower add-on was sold with either 128 or 256K of memory. This machine has the larger configuration, and that gives me an idea. The 256K is provisioned in 32 separate 64K-bit DRAM chips. 16 on this riser, and 16 more underneath that are part of the co-power board itself. Unlike a C64, this is a rare part and replacement RAM chips are pretty expensive, so let's be careful not to damage it any further. If I'm correct, based on the product literature, I should be able to remove the riser board and operate the system in a 128K configuration. This will allow me to isolate half of the memory right off the bat. Curiously, we have Intel DRAM on the co-power itself and MOSTEC chips on the expansion. Looking at the datasheets, they should be interchangeable though. With the upper 128K removed, let's retest the same DOS commands that crashed the system earlier. Okay, that's already promising. Now how about Jim's test program?
Now we're getting somewhere. We've already narrowed down the problem to the upper half of the memory. This is going to be an easy fix, right? It's nice that every chip in the system is socketed. That said, in part one, we experienced a disk controller failure due to oxidation and wasted a lot of time looking at the disk drive itself when it was the socketed chip all along. To avoid making that mistake again, let's extract each of the RAM modules and spray some contact cleaner in there before trying anything else. If only it were that easy. After treating every socket and reinstalling the memory expansion, the problem unfortunately remains. Now at this point, it would make the most sense to stop and test each of the RAM chips on the expansion board. That said, I don't own a Retro Chip Tester Pro or any other product that could do the job. I have one of the popular TL866 programmers, and these can be used to test all kinds of ICs, including logic chips and SRAM. The Copower, however, uses DRAM modules, which cannot be tested with this device. What I can use is this brand new Handtech portable oscilloscope, which I hope will lead me to the root of the problem. It's been almost 25 years since I last used the scope, and they've certainly become affordable in that time, but I'm more than a bit rusty. How hard can it be though? The expansion board uses MOSTEC 4564N-20 1-bit DRAM. Here's the pinout, so let's start testing with the machine booted into DOS and trying to run a program. Fun fact, this is the same part used in some IBM PCXTs, Amigas, and Ataris. The 20 isn't for 20 nanoseconds, it's 200. The first thing I want to look at is the data outline. This should give me an idea whether each of the 8 bits of RAM is doing anything or not. Adjusting the X and Y scales using buttons is a little cumbersome compared to knobs, but I'll get the hang of it eventually. This one looks like it's sending data. Let's check all the others. Okay, all eight data outlines appear to be functioning normally, to my untrained eye at least. Next, I'll test each of the eight address lines. These are shared across every chip, so I'm just going to test one for starters. A0, A2, and A1 all look good. How about A6? Seems okay. A3? A4? A5? Hold up now. A7 is okay. Yeah, A5 looks weird. Let me pause that. Let's zoom out. Yeah, that doesn't look right to me. What do you think? Just for good measure, let me test A5 on each of the RAM chips. The line is shared, so I'm not going to be able to isolate the problem doing this. Yeah, it looks bad everywhere. I wonder if it's a single RAM module causing this, or if it's an LS logic chip that's gone bad. This gives me somewhere to start at least. Here's a better view of the waveform using the PC software, starting with the good address line. I repeated the test with only the base 128K installed, and A5 looked completely fine so it appears to be a problem with one of the expansion memory chips. To find it, I popped out each of the MOSTEC ICs one at a time and then retested A5, but the problem persisted, so it's either more than one bad module, which is unlikely, or something is wrong upstream. Let's take a look at the schematic. Thanks to Mr. Fish on Atari Age, I was able to get a copy of the Copower schematics. Without them, I wouldn't have been able to get very far. First thing we need to understand is that the 8088 CPU has 20 address lines and can handle a maximum of 1 megabyte of memory. Our system has 16 or 32 1-bit DRAM chips, each sharing 8 address lines. A non-trivial number of 74LS logic chips are used by the CoPower board to handle address bus multiplexing and timing. Locating the bad A5 line on the RAM side, we can see it traces back to an LS257 MUX at U27 pin 4. Because the base 128K seems to work fine, we can't rule out the expansion RAM yet. Another possibility is that the multiplexer here is marginal, 
and adding the additional 16 memory chips to the bus pushes it over some tolerance threshold. Here, I'm swapping identical chips U27 and U26 to see if the problem moves to a different address line. Well, A5 seems okay now. If the problem was pin 4, we would expect to see A6 have errors after the swap. However, the issue is now on A7, which is pin 9 instead. Huh. Suspicious, but maybe the root cause lies elsewhere. I'll swap the chips back for now. Another logic chip that's important to the RAM address bus is U18, the LS244 line driver. This device buffers the DRAM refresh address that's generated by the memory controller logic. Pin 16, of course, shows the same bad signal we measured before. I reseated the chip and hit it with some contact cleaner, but observed no change. Moving on, U9 provides the REF6 timing signal that controls the state of the line driver we just looked at. U9 is the same LS161 as U10, so I swapped the two around and retested. Again, no change, so I'm going to rule out U9 as the culprit. Okay, the multiplexer and line driver are still suspects, but we should also check the source lines that are used to derive the output of the problematic pin 4. In this case, that's address line A13 and A5 that originate at the CPU itself. One thing we need to be aware of is on an 8088, pins 9 through 16 are both data and address lines, input and output. This was done for packaging purposes, and it requires the use of the 74LS373 to latch the address lines indicated here by U19. First, let's check out pin 11 on the CPU. That's address and data line 5. Yep, as expected, it's busy doing I.O. Now let's look at the U19 latch. Okay, first the input coming from the CPU. Now the output. I'd say A5 looks good. Now let's look at A13. Here's A13 coming straight from the CPU. This isn't a dual input output pin, so we don't have to worry about the latch. Everything looks normal in DOS right up until I try to run some software, and then the line goes dead. Is the CPU the root cause, or is it just crashing because of something else? Another data point. The CPU gets really hot, but only when the problem manifests. Otherwise, it's cool as a cucumber. I was really hoping the 8088 was the cause of the problem. I swapped it for a known good part that I had on hand, but the issue remained. So, it's clearly another chip that's corrupting the A5 signal, and U27 is still the prime suspect. Remember when I said earlier that the TL866 programmer can be used to test certain ICs? This seems like the perfect opportunity to try it out. Let's start by testing both the U26 and U27 multiplexers. Okay, those check out. Now I'll test the U18 line driver. Okay, that passed too. Now, just because the chips pass these tests under ideal conditions doesn't mean that a marginal IC won't misbehave in situ. At this point, I still can't say definitively that these are good. In order to be sure, I ordered up replacement logic chips on DigiKey. I would have also purchased some RAM, but the MOSTEC part is getting harder and harder to find, and they're not stocked by the usual vendors. And a few days later, the parts arrived. Let's get this opened up so we can install them in the co-power board and hopefully solve this mystery once and for all. I really didn't want to just randomly start throwing parts at the problem, but I think we've done our due diligence and hopefully narrowed things down enough that this step makes sense now. I am, of course, still learning as I go here, so it's entirely possible I've missed something obvious.
Upon retesting, the problem remained. Time and money wasted, but at least now we know for sure what it isn't. Running out of ideas, I poured over the schematic looking for anything else that could be responsible. I was only able to identify one other chip that was using the A5 line, and that's U28, a 2732A EEPROM. May as well try and rule that out, I guess. To do that, I first needed a known good copy of the data the EEPROM is programmed with. I was able to locate a dump of the chip on the Don Maslin ROM archive by the 81-356 that's printed on the label affixed to U28. Once again, using the TL866, I loaded the ROM dump and verified the contents of my chip. As before, this is a controlled, ideal environment, so some uncertainty will always remain. So, only one thing left to do, really, and that's test the expansion RAM, isn't it? Without a proper tester, I'm just going to swap all the MOSTEC modules onto the main co-power board where the Intel parts were, and see what happens. All right, here we go. Uh, what? Why you gotta hurt me like this, K-Pro? Okay, well, that was unexpected. Let's up the ante and put the Intel RAM on the expansion board and test with that. What? I can't even... Ugh. Well, my two benchmark tests are both working fine with the full 256k of RAM installed now. But as before, nothing else will run. There's either insufficient memory, software is trying to call some PC-specific BIOS or hardware that isn't available, or perhaps there's still a problem somewhere with the co-power. In its current state, all the address lines look fine now. So where was the problem? Is it miraculously better with just the RAM swapped around? Have I been observing the cause of the failure or just a symptom of a crash? This one has me perplexed. Did you see something I missed? If so, let me know in the comments. It's really confounding that something failed halfway through testing in the last episode, resulting in an unfair assessment in the system. But hey, that's the nature of using retro hardware, right? Even more frustrating is that I wasn't able to zero in on the exact cause of the problem, nor am I 100% sure if the system is working or not, because I don't have a good baseline and most software still won't run. For now, I'll be withholding an apology to the K-Pro until I know for sure. I think a RAM tester will be in my future at some point. With some more experience, this little scope will be a game changer for these sorts of repairs. Of course, if I had spent less time playing Quake in college and more time studying, I might have been able to figure this out today. I hope you enjoyed this bit, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.